We'll get, we'll be fun. <laughs> All right, here we go. Hello and welcome to Call of the Senate, a podcast presented by the Minnesota Senate DFL Caucus. I'm Luke Bishop. The topic of today's episode is education, and we're joined by two education champions in the Minnesota Senate. Senator Chuck Weger of Maplewood. Welcome to the show, Senator. Thanks for joining. Thank you. And Thank you. And Senator Steve Swadzinski of Eden Prairie. Thanks for joining us, Senator Swadzinski. My pleasure. So I'd like to begin with Senator Weger. Um, the Senate bill has no money for increasing the basic funding formula uh, on education in Minnesota. And so Senator Weger, can you just explain to the listeners what the basic funding formula is and talk about the harm caused to students, teachers, and schools when there isn't an increase made to the basic funding formula? Yes. The basic funding formula is the primary financial means that districts rely on for funding their programs. It's 62% actually of the budget for most school districts, and there is no increase at all, zero in the Republican uh, Senate Republican bill. So that means there's going to be cuts. Now, in terms of what those cuts are going to be, the survey that has been done by the business officials says that it's going to be millions. In fact, nonpartisan research estimates that by not accounting for inflation, over $365 million in cuts will have to be made. 92% of districts say we're going to make cuts, millions. Uh, you can go to the largest district in Okahannepin, over 14 million, to smaller districts and you know just ask them. And what does this mean? It's going to mean uh, teachers laid off, terminated. It could mean coaches. It could be nurses, counselors. It will be larger class sizes. Uh, extracurricular activities. It might be a program that uh, helps a, a student to stay in school, if you will, where they're really involved. Maybe it's in band, et cetera. So it's devastating to not be able to keep place, uh, pace with the inflation needs of a district. And uh, you know, just as we have to uh, account for inflation in our own budgets, uh, you know, so do the local school districts. So by not accounting for inflation in the uh, the formula with zero increase, it's gonna be cuts. And that's gonna be lots of people that are gonna get laid off. In fact, there's notices going out now because we have not been able to give a, a firm uh, signal as to what's gonna be done. So uh, it's not good news. We're gonna do our very best. We thank Governor Walls for uh, putting a very uh, ambitious uh, target as we call it for the need for additional funding in that formula. Very important. Certainly. and so. Senator Swadzinski, uh, we just saw Senator Weger mentioned a little bit about how the Senate formula or the, the Senate bill doesn't have that increase, but he also mentioned that the governor uh, has a different proposal and that the Senate bill is not the only proposal here. So I'm just wondering if you could sort of talk about, you know, the major differences between the education spending proposals put forth by the House, the Senate and the governor and, you know, where are the biggest and most notable gaps? Well, yeah, the biggest gap, as Senator Weger already pointed out, is in the funding formula. Um, the the Republic, the GOP Senate, is zero percent, um, as as Senator Weger pointed out. And the the governor, when he came out with his um, Do North, is that what it was called, the Do North plan? I was so giddy because I, well, I haven't used that word in a while. Um, I was so giddy because I was just pumped up. Everything in there was like a teacher and students and, and the, uh, the critical staff that supports education come true. Um, the, the, the general, the funding formula increase, I believe was one in two per, one in 2.5% or two and yeah. two. I think it was two and two and the house's bill, no, it was one and 2.5. And then the house's bill was two and two. And for us to come forward with zero and zero is, is just, um, you know, the morale of our teachers, the students don't 
many, most don't really know what's going on at the legislature and what the funding formula is, but the teachers sure do. And when they find out that there's members of the, of the 201 of us that are looking at zero and zero and not even an increase to keep up with inflation, as, as Senator Weger pointed out, where morale is, is gonna be low at a year when it is already low. And we should be um, helping our students through helping our teachers with a decent increase in funding after this year of challenges. Certainly, and Senator Weger, do you have any thoughts on those voucher provisions or is there anything you'd like to add on that? This would be the largest voucher program in America. We have this constitutional duty to provide a general, uniform, thorough, efficient system for our public schools. This will drain, it will siphon a quarter of a billion out from public schools by 2025. And this is nonpartisan research estimate. The largest parent organization in Minnesota, they said, this is a significant step backward, the voucher proposal. They said, this violates the spirit of public education. I agree with the PTA and the many others that we need to fully invest in our public schools. The voucher proposal will defund our public schools. It'll set us in the wrong direction. And just as we strongly support the governor's due north, this would be due south and we're opposed. Absolutely, yes. And I wanna shift gears just a little bit here uh, to Senator Swadzinski. So you've, you've long advocated for a provision that would require that civics courses be taught uh, as a graduation requirement. So I'm just wondering if you could talk about what inspired this idea and what impact you think it would have if all Minnesota um, high schoolers took a civics course. Yeah, and, and just as a, before I go on to my tirade, um, personal finance, um, uh, 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 financial literacy class as well, both civics and financial literacy. And, I, I, um, be, and, and the page amendment, I know that's probably not gonna come up um, today because we have a lot to talk about, but the, the good news about the page amendment is getting people talking about um, education. But one of the things in, and I'm opposed to the page amendment, but, um, but the, one of the things I do like about it is there's a line in the amendment that says, um, the economic, um, to be prepared to, to be part of the economic system of American democracy and to be part of the civic experiment in American democracy is part of the language of the Page Amendment. And so clearly there's a need out there among the people of Minnesota to have a requirement. And, and some schools are requiring civics in ninth grade. Ninth graders, and I know there's many that would argue ninth graders are old enough, um, they're mature enough, they're wise enough, but I taught ninth grade, I taught 10th, I taught 11th, and I taught 12th grade over my 33 years, and um, men, some ninth graders do act and are wise enough to, to pass as 11th and 12th graders, but overall, um, the class needs to be offered. I, I taught American government to seniors for almost all of those 33 years. By the time they're seniors, they're signing up for selective service. They're, they're paying gas taxes at the pump. They're paying, they're seeing their first pay stubs show this income tax on it. Um, they're, they're getting ready to vote for their first election and register for that. And, um, and, and, and being seniors in high school, and I can't tell you, and I, I hope someday all these students that said this to me over the years, collectively set up some kind of a website saying we need to have a, a civics class required because I had so many kids specifically third and fourth term of their senior year after the government class would say to me I can't believe I was this close to graduating without any knowledge of how my country's government um, and, and what my responsibilities are as a citizen um, and I came this close to graduating without knowing any of that and so you know it, it, I've been um, by those 12,000 kids I taught, and most of them, as I said, were seniors. Um, I know firsthand how important a civics class is, your junior or senior, and we've compromised. I originally wanted it the senior year, but we've made some um, concessions to people that um, have concerns about it. And one of those concessions was a junior senior um, class, which, you know, a lot of juniors and seniors, you really, they're, they're, um, they're in the same boat. So anyways, um, and I just want to thank um, Senator Weger from day one, the first day I met him, he's been a champion on this. And uh, so let's just um, try to get it done some session. 
it took a 12 years to pass hands-free driving. So I'm I'm holding out to beat that on um, getting civics passed. And Chuck, um, he said a quarter billion. I think I said a quarter million. So I just want to stand corrected on that number um, that would be taken from the public schools. Got it. Good. I appreciate that. So, uh, you know, uh, another thing that's been important that, you know, again, shifting gears here uh, and an important way that we can support um, students is with mental health. And it's been an important point of contention between the Democrats and Republicans in the Minnesota legislature this year uh, is on funding for mental health support in schools. So there's money for school counselors and support staff in the House bill, um, but not in the Senate bill. So why is this mental health spending is so critical and, and what difference would it make in schools? I'll start out, uh, we are facing a mental health crisis in our country and pre-COVID, we had a crisis going. Uh, the challenges that uh, students and just the general population face and the situation since COVID has only been further exacerbated with isolation, uh, with racial unrest, with blatant acts of discrimination, uh, particularly against our, uh, our Asian uh, students. Uh, many have, have not even returned to school yet because of that. Uh, anxiety levels, and so there needs to be a significant infusion of additional services to address mental health needs of students. And uh, this is, uh, it May is National Mental Health Awareness Month, and there are plenty of great websites available for people. And it used to be in the narrative that uh, one in five or one in four people are affected. Everybody is affected by mental health. And whether it's yourself or someone in your family or someone that you know, and we need to totally get rid of the stigma and do whatever we can. A student in a classroom or in distance learning, if they are feeling isolated, discriminated, et cetera, if they don't receive the help that's needed, the services that can be provided through mental health support, through counselors, social workers, and others, it's going to have an impact on their learning and their overall ability to cope. We must do all we can. Uh, the Republicans have put some additional funds in some programs, but we need to do substantially more. And the Senate DFL, the governor, the House fully support a all hands on deck approach. Certainly, Senator Swadzinski, do you have anything to add to that on the, yeah, on the mental I health agree. support? Everything Senator Weger just said is spot on. I, I don't know what has happened, but I, I do know this. We're 44th in the nation in counselor to student ratios. Um, we pride ourselves on the education state, and yet we, we don't fund our counselors and, and, and those in the, in the, in the um, at the forefront of trying to help kids um, through some pretty trying and troubling times. And um, I don't know what's happened, but I know that when I first started teaching in 1985, maybe one kid out of 100, I'd get a memo on on the first day of class saying, you know, just Johnny is, is struggling um, with some issues right now and um, just, you know, keep an eye on him. And by the tail end of my career um, in 2016, as Chuck said, he said um, 20, um, one out of five. And that, that's pretty accurate. I'd get about 20 emails from counselors saying out of 100 kids that, you know, um, Johnny and Missy and all the, 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 the suffering right now. So just kind of keep an eye on them. So I don't know if we're getting better at diagnosing them or, or if we've got some serious environmental issues that we've got to deal with. But boy, we somebody's got to get a handle on this. And as Chuck said, um, it, we got to get rid of the stigma of mental health and um, so that we're more open to talking about it. Absolutely. Now, I, I want to uh, I want to talk about the conference committee. Um, Senator Weger, you're on the Education Conference Committee, which recently adopted two important provisions. The first one, authored by Senator Weger, is a parental notification for uh, of an environmental hazard in a school. Um, the second one, authored by Senator Swadzinski, imposes a limit on pre-K student screen time. So the conference, like as I mentioned, the conference committee adopted both of these. Um, and could you two each speak to the details of your respective amendments, starting with Senator uh, Senator Weger? Yes, uh, thanks. Students, staff, 
parents have an expectation when uh, school's in session that the school is safe. The proposal that I authored, and it did have bipartisan support, would provide information to staff, to students and parents if there is an environmental hazard at the school, if they are on notice, that students know what they may be at risk for and what staff would be at risk for. Uh, this was triggered by the water gremlin case a couple of years ago where trichloroethylene TCE had spewed out of the uh, factory for 17 years, tons of TCE and not too far from a school in, uh, in the area and parents were alarmed and they found out actually on Facebook and on WCCO on a TV report. And so uh, we want to make sure when there is an environmental hazard, uh, we've seen in the past, for example, asbestos, uh, we know all about the, the lead in terms of you know, chemicals that can cause an issue for students and their ability to learn. In this case, environmental hazards, let's provide information so they know how to respond. That we have a fundamental expectation that schools should be safe places to learn. And we're happy that that provision has been included for uh, environmental uh, hazard notification, parents, and, uh, staff, students, so they'll know what to do in the future. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Senator Swadzinski, could you tell us a little bit about your amendment? Yeah, my bill um, uh, would, um, students that are in um, public funded pre-K would not be allowed to use a cell phone individually unless they're on an, um, um, a learning plan, a special ed plan. Otherwise, um, the, the staff can't just hand a kid a, a cell phone or a, a laptop or an um, iPad and say, hey, you can play alone for half an hour. Um, so, and that does have bipartisan support, but um, unfortunately the funding um, for pre-K in this budget, the Senate um, has not funded any pre-K programs. So <laughs> the bill might be moot because there'd be no one in pre-K in public schools. Um, so, but nonetheless, I just, I don't know, I, as I said earlier, I don't know what's causing the, the rise in mental health, but um, we've got to start tr trying to figure it out. And, and maybe it's the amount of screen time we're spending um, staring at um, screens instead of, um, of loved ones and members of our species. And uh, um, so any, anyways, it's a baby step. So before we wrap up here, I wanna talk about one more issue that's really important uh, to the entire caucus. I think the Senate DFL caucus is fairly unified uh, or quite unified around the idea that we need more black, indigenous and people of color as teachers in our schools. So how might Minnesota students a benefit if we were to attract more teachers of color uh, to our schools uh, and, and to, to serve as teachers in our classrooms? This is highest of priorities. Uh, students will benefit, the, uh, uh, whether it's a students of color, indigenous or uh, Caucasian by having better diversity in the classroom. The research is clear that academic performance will increase if you have more teachers that look like the students that are culturally relevant in terms of uh, students. Academic performance will improve. And so right now, only 6% of Minnesota's uh, teachers are teachers of color, indigenous, and the uh, population of students for that area is over one third and eventually it will be the majority. And in fact, in several districts, it is the majority. Recognizing that we have a shared bipartisan goal of closing the opportunity gap to increase achievement, we must uh, have a very active campaign to attract, to train and retain teachers of color, indigenous, uh, teachers. And so we have uh, put in a number of programs working with uh, several coalitions to do this. Uh, there is some funding in the, uh, the Senate bill to do this, but we need to do much more. We've uh, advocated that. Uh, one of our colleagues uh, new to the Senate, but certainly uh, very experienced on this issue is Senator Mary Kunish. And uh, she was the chief author in the House and spoke 
very eloquently. She was a co-author on this, uh, this session. And so we're all working together to uh, provide more teachers of color, indigenous teachers, and we'll get there. And I mentioned Senator Kunish, and, uh, who was a teacher, uh, and library specialist for 25 years. Uh, I'm so pleased that you know, to have Senator Swedinsky with over 30 years of classroom experience. He mentioned over 10,000 students. And also uh, on, on the E12, the uh, team for DFL, uh, we have Senator Jason Isaacson, who's just a tremendous uh, legislator. Uh, he's an educator as well. And, uh, and they're all parents as well, but they have that classroom experience. And that definitely adds to our perspective in terms of what is happening and what needs to be done to help all students. Thanks. And Senator Weger was on a school board, so don't dismiss that role in education, Chuck. Yeah, um, yeah I would, if I have time to add, I, I just think um, as Senator Weger suggested, I think that was, um, you know, as the session began, I, I think that might have been number one for me um, besides civics education. <laughs> but uh, because, um, you know, I don't know, I, I, Chuck called it the opportunity gap, I don't, or the achievement gap or the vulnerability gap. I don't know what you want to call that gap, but it's clearly a gap. And in my 33 years in Eden Prairie High School, I'd say I had 50 soul studies teachers who came and went, retired, or maybe they left after a couple of years, and there was one that um, uh, that did not look like me, one out of 50. And that's ridiculous. Um, in social studies, the study of society, we had one um, African-American male teacher in all those years. And um, if I was a seventh grade girl and I was thinking about becoming a teacher, but I never saw one that looked like me, I would think that that profession was closed to me. Or if I was a 11th grade um, you know, thinking about maybe a career in teaching um, and never saw one that looked like me, I think, well, you know, maybe that's something that's not an option for me. So um, as, as Senator Weger alluded to, with that, that, that's priority number one in both of our eyes this session. Absolutely. Well, Senator Weger, Senator Swadzinski, thank you so much for taking the time to join the podcast this morning. I really appreciate you joining us. So, uh, so thanks for thanks for coming on to the show. Thanks, well, thank you very much. And uh, just a reminder, students are our future. Thank you. That's it for today's episode of the Call of the Senate. You can find us online at senatedfl.mn or on social media under the username Senate DFL. See you again next week.